Welcome back, guys, to the Full Drive Podcast. This is episode two. Last time we well, we introduced the show, the big pilots. How are you feeling, Liam? Pretty excited again, Ronnie. It's uh, yeah, great to be back. Um, hopefully, the first episode went really well. Um, we're back today to talk about some stock vehicles. We're obviously driven by Shelter, and again, Southern River Band leading us in. Mate, what what a cracker of an intro! It is a, I like a cracker. It. I, really like I keep it. reiterating, "Let It Ride" is the name of the song. Fits perfectly to what we're about here Definitely. on the Four Wheel Drive Podcast. Um, Before we go any further, I'm Ronnie Dahl, and yeah, I'm Liam Duggan. If you don't recognise the voices yet after the first episode, um, we'll keep introducing ourselves while it's early days. Um, mate, today's interesting. Everyone can get involved in today's podcast. Because Definitely. A stock vehicle, there's plenty on the roads if you're thinking about being into four wheel driving. Yep. Um, Even if they don't have a car, they can hire one. You, you can hire, there is a lot out there. So, mate, it's a pretty broad topic to start off with. Um, but our, as, as you just get fixed up there, Ronnie, that's uh, all good. Uh, I suppose we're, we're going to start with test driving the new cars that are out there you've done a little bit of this yeah. yourself I've done, I've done a bit of test driving and at, at the thing is like at the level of, of full driving that i've been doing as of late you know with highly modified vehicles and stuff you quickly forget how capable a stock vehicle is they are honestly sometimes more capable because they're lighter yep. you haven't done all the stuff to them you haven't put big tires that compromises the rolling resistance and all this kind of stuff yep. so a stock vehicle driven the right way can almost go as far as a heavily modified vehicle but there's some things you wouldn't do in it of course of course yeah which is exciting to hear for because i feel that utes are just more and more popular you drive around the the streets now and just about just, every man and his dog's yeah. got one um so it's exciting that they're that the capabilities of these modern four-wheel drives uh you know they're there for you to, to get started really yeah um, for sure i mean some of the new four wheel drives they are getting a little bit a little bit over complicated yep but anything from you know 2020 and back if anyone has a vehicle like that then they're generally pretty easy to to get used to off-road pretty quick yeah um, it's just those real new ones they got like off-road modes and stuff they can get a bit daunting and sometimes they don't actually do what they're supposed to do yeah okay but we'll get into that yeah so is there any that stand out to you off the top of your head, like oh, modern look, modern four wheel drives that are pretty capable stock. Yeah, look, um, anything to do with a patrol or a Land Cruiser. Yep. Uh, look, a Hilux they've always been good. Um, Prados, you know, Ranger, Isuzu D Max, and look, even the Everest and the MUX. There's so many cars out there, yeah. and, and most of them are, are, you know, they're up for the task. Look, yep. even an X Trail. So I test drove. Well, the wife's X Trail is her car. Yeah. And even that's capable of doing soft roading. So explain that. So soft roading is where the vehicle is not, it's not, it doesn't have like a heavy gauge transfer case or gearbox. So this has a, I forgot what it's called, a VCT. It's a variable speed gearbox or transmission. So you don't feel the gear change. It's just like a rubber band and then it expands and contracts. That is not able to absorb a lot of heat or it heat will kill it. So when you go off-road in an X-Trail, you can go four-wheel drive, high range. It doesn't have low range. You can go up to about 40 kilometers per hour. Once you exceed 40 kilometers per hour, say at Lanson Dunes, it cuts out four-wheel drive right. and you're back in front-wheel drive. And if you don't realize that you have to actually manually put it back when you go slower than 40 again, you're in two-wheel drive and you can get bogged really easy. So even once you drop down below 40 again, that won't It won't re-engage. automatically go in. Right. Yeah, so I mean, every vehicle has some limitations. Like, say for instance, uh, your Ranger. That, that I mean, that's that's a very capable car from stock as well. Yeah, well, that's that's a thing. I, I suppose if you're going to to go a, a stock vehicle and, and you want to get into the full driving, I, I suppose if you're going to decide between an X Trail and a Ranger or, or something of that similar. Yeah. Um, it, depending on where you you know, obviously price and and all that ties in with things. But what I could do in my Ranger stock was was more than enough, especially starting out for what I needed at totally. the time. Um, a lot of the time I wasn't in four low, it was four high, sand, gravel, yeah. um, just learning the ins and outs. I suppose, as you say, before 2020, everything was a little bit more simple. So I've still got just the, I, I do have a dial, but it's just, it's two, four high, four low, nice and simple. There's, yeah. There's no, There's no modes. sand, snow, mud. Yeah. Um, so I, I do enjoy that, that aspect of it, but, um, 
yeah, certainly there, there's little ins and outs of what a stock vehicle can and can't do, but for sure, definitely capable yeah. in a in a Range or a Hilux, a D Max. Um, yeah, yeah it, you're going to be no worries. It's all vehicle specific as well, but most dual cab Utes look they're all capable they're all very capable vehicles they're fine to take off road um in saying that i did have a bad experience with or concerning experiences with uh the ford ranger the new one because okay. it has a 10-speed gearbox i drove it up and down the beach four times uh, in low range and the gearbox got really hot so that is a concern but it's a brand new gearbox it's a brand new engine and generally series one you're going to have issues with it's yeah, like the 200 the series mate. when it first come yeah. out and you know, so you're going to have uh, issues with these cars. And I'm sure Series 2, Series 3, by the time uh, you might look for an upgrade, the car's sorted, right? It's fine. Yep. It's just the danger of buying the Series 1 of a brand new release vehicle. You are essentially a guinea pig amongst many yeah. others. Yep, you Especially are. if you take it off-road. Yeah. Um, I suppose that as well. We touched on the last episode, but the mechanical nature of your older four-wheel drives, yeah. uh, the, the 70 Series of patrols, uh, not... There's not a lot less that can go wrong, but if you Robust. do get into trouble out there, there's you know, it's a lot easier to be mechanically minded than it is electrically or yeah, you know, for with, sure. With the auto electrics, it's uh, you're getting into some pretty dicey areas there, especially if you're around water and yeah, know, all this sort of thing. So especially the, the gauge of wire these days. Yeah, okay. It's so small, so if you get a bit of green death on it, like green death being salt water with copper what would you call it uh green death green death <laughs> yeah so green death it starts green and then it goes black and then you lose the signals between the wires right. and with these wiring harnesses it's all like micro like minuscule like um volts going through yep so that the vehicle knows how to behave and stuff and it's something like that gets green death uh it's the, the car's eventually not going to work for you yep the, the uh the new car anxiety that people get when you you or you buy a new four-wheel drive you, yeah. you've got great intentions to go out there and, and use it and, and, and get it amongst the bush and the sand and, and all that uh, does it take long to to wear off that, that new car anxiety depends what you put it through I've still got it and I'm yeah. I've had my cars for six years and it's done 150,000 k's but I, I don't want to scratch it up and okay well I'll put it to you this way if you take your car to the car park and you get a dent <laughs> from a trolley you're going to be pretty upset about that I'll be very upset but if you're in a bush and you're doing some technical section and you get to the top of this hill and you feel like you conquered it, but you got a, you got a dent, that dent has a story. There's, yeah, you're right. So you'd probably rather that than the other, right? Yeah, definitely. Yep, yeah, I'll see your point. I've actually got a massive, uh, we call it dent in Victoria. Um, you guys say dent, but I've got, I've, for purposes, I'll say dent. Um, <laughs> you say dent? Dent, yeah, dent. Really? Yeah, it's a dent. Wow. Yeah, like that surfboard's got plenty of dents through it. Anyway, plenty of dents and, and scratches. We can take that off there. Um, <laughs> yeah, a, a mate borrowed my car. Um, I'm going to name and shame him. It's Fraser McInnes. Uh, Jack knifed a trailer with my ute. and Oh, no. He didn't get it fixed for me. I said I would look after it and let him know when it was time to go into the panel beaters and all this sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, like you say, that has a ripping story to it. Um, I touch base with, with Fraser when I catch up with him um, <laughs> regularly now, but it's uh, like you say, if there's a story to it, then I suppose it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've, I've still got new car anxiety, pinstripes, and all this. But being a white vehicle, it's yeah. it's um, a little bit easier to, to hide. But. It is. It is. It, that's that's what's funny, isn't it? Like white white vehicles is easier to hide yeah. the scratches and stuff. Yeah. You have a you have a black or a graphite vehicle. Wow. What have you got on your? You've got. Well, what is that? Uh, so the protection panels yeah. I have on my 79. Yeah. Okay, so um, before I tell you what they are, underneath those panels is a completely flogged... <laughs> like. So it looks like it's been used. Oh, mate, it's dents, there's scratches, there's gouges, there's a bit of rust here and there. All bodies, you know, so sort of, yeah, on the surface. Yep. Those panels are called rhino hide. So um, what they are, they sit on the, on the outside of your vehicle. And it's so for brand new cars, you stick that on, you go down a tight track, like say Wilbinger or something, yep. where like you get the coastal tracks, they're really scratchy. And especially if you hit dead branches, that's what scratches you more. So a quick tip, if you're on a track and it's tight, aim for, you know, lean into the side that has the live bushes, not the dead bushes. So lean for the green. Lean for the green because yep. it's going to give you a nice soft scratch instead of a, yep. oh, one of those yeah, yeah, the, terrible the noise. Chalkboard. But this will prevent the damage to the car. But that's not the reason why it's on my vehicle. It's there to hide the damage it, that yeah. I already have. <laughs> so that's is that available for 
Can I get that for the Ranger? Is that? I believe you can. Yeah, yeah pretty. You definitely the new Ranger. Yep. But I'm pretty sure you can get it for your Ranger. Uh, you can get it for Hilux. Most like uh, like 200 series, 70 series, 79 series only the dual cab. So there's select vehicles. Yeah, okay. I know the guy personally who um who developed it. It's called Rhino Hide, and he was actually on that Shark Tank. Oh right. Yeah, and that seasonal Shark Tank, he was the only one that actually the investors worked really? with because everyone else was full of full of shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't um, know that. Yeah, so he um he's developed that and um yeah, it just prevents the scratches on your on your car. It used to be magnets, but now it's like free M tape. So it's taped yeah, on. Yeah, right, I was gonna say it's and then the studs are on. Right. But many people are like, oh, why do you drill that into your car? Yeah, yeah, it's not true. Like yeah, yeah, yeah it's I noticed on. it before. Yeah. Um I suppose we we've digressed a little bit here, but the New versus old, if you you're probably pretty set with your vehicles at the moment, but if you're if you're in the market for a new a new truck yep. right now, or any any four wheel drive, what oh. are, are you going newer? I know you're an old fan. Yeah. Um but maybe something something post twenty fifteen, what are you looking what are you looking at? Well, if I'm going for Ute, like look, Hilux is probably my first yep. choice. Um I'd definitely consider a Ranger. Uh the D forty Navara, it's probably not going to be my choice just because I know there was a few problems with them. Yeah. The new Navara, I think it's called the D23, I think. They've gone backwards in numbers for some yeah, reason. Yeah, yep. yeah it's, it's a tough one. Look, that, that one actually has coil suspension front and rear where most utes, they have the, the leaf pack on the back. Yeah. Like, like yours yep. does and like mine does. And they're kind of more rigid and sometimes a bit less comfortable when, you know, you're driving on corrugations and things. But... Off road, they're just as capable as yep. as a coil sprung vehicle. In yeah, my right. Mind. Yeah, it, it, it's a hard choice. Like, I, I, I thought you were going to ask me what I'd choose right now if I had to buy a brand new twenty twenty three. I'm glad you didn't. Well, go on. <laughs> I put myself there, didn't I? <laughs> um, I would. Uh, are we talking cost here? Budget? Uh, no, nah, free out your budget. Okay. Let loose. Oh look, I'll, I'll just go another seventy nine series, yeah, because they're still available. Yeah, yeah but if yeah. it was something to, to design right now, I, I'm not really sure. I'd have to really think long and hard. That might be yeah. that might be something for us moving forward, Jaden. Take down in your notes, mate. Oh, the uh, new versus old, a bit of a and a bit of a car sales sort of. We we can go do our research and yeah, you know, we can budget up, see what we've got to use, find what we think is that'll be cool actually. Um, you know, I, I'm on car sales quite a bit anyway. Um, You're looking probably, for something new, are you? I, 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 I just, I just love seeing what's out there. I think, yeah. especially post COVID, there's the prices yeah. hiked obviously, and, they and they're, they're be, coming down. They are coming down, which I'm starting to see, which is great yeah. because, like I say, I'm, I'm a troopy tragic, um, and I'm just keeping a pretty better, close eye on those. Yeah. But, um, Look out, Liam's going to swoop in on your yeah, deal. Yeah, I know it's, uh, <laughs> it's dangerous. Um, Mate, yeah. continuing along the lines of stock, or stock I, vehicles, I, I yeah. want to keep um, keep going on with this because I suppose in these early episodes we're, we're keen on people getting involved, yes. and getting out there, and yeah. Um, so I guess people... we need to talk about tires, don't we? Yeah, well, like, that, that's that's the first thing. Limitations are, are, yeah. are obviously straight away off the factory floor. Yeah, straight off the factory floor, the tires you get, if you're lucky, they're they're HTs. Yep. Yeah, or, or sorry, LTs. You're lucky if the LTs being light, LT? light, light truck. Yeah, that okay. means that the construction in in a sidewall stronger. Yeah, right. Um, if you have HTs, which are highway terrain, uh, there's not much stiffness in a sidewall, and they're very susceptible for tire punctures. Yep. I took a Ford Ranger, the one I spoke about before, out, and we lowered the tires like we should. We're driving in on a gravel road, and there was one rock somewhere that I didn't see, but that busted the tire. Right. That's all it took, and we just drove in, and I was like, oh, yeah. no, now I've got to be super careful because yep. that's the yeah, spare. Yeah, then you're on edge, aren't you? Yeah, the then whole you're on time. edge, and yeah. it's not my car, and, yep. you know. So, I guess the first thing, if you were going to change on a car, would be the tires, but that doesn't mean you have to change the tires. So if you have highway terrain, yes, you can go forward driving um, with lower tire pressure. Definitely lower your tire pressure. But just be careful. If there's a lot of rock around, maybe don't lower them as much as what you normally would for sand. But when you get to the sand, lower them again. It's just a two-stage process. Yep. But the cool thing is, with a vehicle with stock tires, they're small. So to lower the tires, it's going to take half the time it would take yeah. yourself or yep. myself, right? So You're Probably sitting at 32... Or thirty yeah. highway tires, like probably yeah, probably about that. On, yeah. a, on a new car, I'll probably yeah. sitting around there. Yeah. Um. 
but I'll probably go down to like 20. Yep. Hit the beach, go down lower, go down to what you, what you need to. Yeah. Start on 20. Yeah. Just if you start feeling like you're going to get bogged, stop. Yep. Lower your tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good way <laughs> to learn. I, I think when I, when I think about limitations as well, they probably are what you make it a little bit because I suppose, well, like we've spoken about, the stock vehicles are quite capable. Um, yes. At, at the base level, I suppose it, it's probably up to you to familiarise yourself a little bit with the functions that it has and especially these newer newer vehicles, if it's hard for you to, to understand some of the, the concepts that they're coming up with, it's oh my god, it's going to be tough yeah. for, for a beginner, eh? So it's... Yeah. Um, I think the, the limitations there, the main one, obviously the tyres, it's the biggest yeah. part of probably four-wheel driving. But I think that, yeah, the, the limitations that you probably... Probably the, just, the the limitations would also be like no 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 protection on it. Yeah. You know, there's, yeah. there's no bull bar, there's no rear bar. Not that you need that anyway. It's just you, you can't just go throwing it around in the bush. Yeah. You know, because yeah. if there's a tree there, you're going to know about yeah. it. Yeah. And you, you talk about approach angles and if you've yeah. got the... You know, your, your stock front bumper on. You don't want to take that off. No, <laughs> That's, yeah. It's the easy That's way to get right. a bull bar on, but it's um, it's not the way that it's a, you want it's, to go about it. It's a good way to get the bull bar past the, the finance minister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah rip that point. bar off. There might be something in there. See, actually, dear, but... we need a bull bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there um, might be something out there for that. Yeah, or just really struggle up a hill. See, dear, we need a, we need a rear diff locker. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. But, yeah. you know, um, limitations, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely, your like you mentioned the departure angles and all that. So um, I, I guess we'll just break it down for people as well. So approach angle, that's when we're approaching something, and a nose might touch. Yep. Um, but that can also be a factor when you're coming down a steep hill. That nose might touch, and once that nose touches, you're generally not going to be able to reverse out yep. of it. You're stuck one way, aren't you? Yeah. Yep. You got to keep going, and you're going to heal that crunching and all that stuff. Um, ramp over. That's that middle bit, um, which can only be improved by raising the tires yep. like getting bigger tires and also a suspension lift so it'll bring the bring the vehicle up a little bit with the rear departure angle that one's probably the hardest one to improve on especially for you yeah um yep. the long with yeah with, with the tub you know yep. you have to some people do like a quarter rear quarter chop right. but i cut the rear bottom part of the tray um it looks pretty cool yeah and it does serve a purpose because you got that about 200 mil where there's nothing behind yeah okay so some people do the the, the chop and then i'll put a rear bar on it sitting up yeah um but yeah that's that's just that's the three angles but we get back to stock so what can you do in a stock vehicle you can almost do everything i guess one of the main limitations is if you want to do a big trip if you've got a ute that's fine because you can throw as many jerry cans in the back yeah, as you yeah. want yep um as you'd be familiar with too right so if you have a wagon where are you going to put the fuel there's nowhere you can really put the fuel unless you upgrade your your tank. Yep. Um, so there is a distance limit. There are some vehicles are probably more suited for certain things than other vehicles are. Um, but I, I don't think having a stock vehicle shouldn't stop you from from heading out bush. Yep. Because you can do a lot in them. And the best way I find is you, you get a stock vehicle and you use it, and then you find the weaknesses as you're driving. So if the weakness is the ramp over angle or, or you keep getting hung up or it's just you, you can't climb where there's big wombat holes, wombat holes being opposing holes that once, you're, once two wheels, opposing wheels are off the ground, if you don't have a differential locker, those wheels are just going to spin yeah, and then are going to dig bigger holes. It's a hard one to understand. The, it is. We'll have to do an episode just yeah, on, on, the, on I, the lockers. Even I'm, I've tried my best and I, I still don't have any clue about lockers and yeah i suppose the function of lockers um, yeah okay we'll, mainly we'll, oh, we'll, we'll, we will we'll, go we'll, we'll get to it touch on it a little bit here but then we'll, we'll deep dive into yeah, it yeah, because there's, yeah. there's certain i think there'll be a lot of people using. out there that don't yeah fully understand yeah but many people out there will have a rear locker in their car that's a cool and thing not, do you have one it. well i've got yeah I, I, I do but i yep. don't know i don't know when to use it or okay um yeah, yeah so I, I i'm very all right, well, in, that, in that instance, yeah. The best time to use your rear locker, you know, when you say, have you been to Wilbinga? Yep. So, you know, those, when you go over those dunes to get closer to the beach and you've got these massive holes. You've got the, yeah. Yeah. The whoops. Yeah, yeah, the whoops. And you're usually stuck in them and then the wheels are spinning, making them yep. deeper or your mate in front of you does it. And you're like, thanks, mate. Yeah, now I've got to try and get over this. So, in that situation, you'd activate the rear locker. Yep. And then it's taken nice and easy because what that's going to do is it's going to force the rear wheels to rotate at the same rate. 
without the rear locker, the diff is open. So a differential, it allows the uh, torque or well, power and torque to, to lease resistance. So if the wheel lifts up, all your power and torque is going to escape out of that wheel. Right, okay. So when you lock a four-wheel drive in the four-wheel drive, you're forcing 50% drive to the front, 50% drive to the back. So you are going to have 50% front and rear constantly. But when you're posing wheels on the front, one's touching, one's not, and then the back, you're going to get two wheels spinning that aren't touching the ground or digging further Just, because yeah because right yeah, because they're, they're like on loose surface where Scraping the others the surface away and, yeah, yeah yeah and all the weights on the other on the other wheels and it's just not sending the torque there or the power so when you lock it you're forcing it so the wheel that's got all the weight and the wheel that's in the air they're going to rotate at the same rate right and then they'll get you out of that situation right. yeah okay yeah can do you have to be stationary to to engage lockers depends on the yeah you should um engage them when you're stationary or moving very slowly okay um, what you don't want to be doing is is giving it heaps of like and throttle. Then throw it in. Yeah, because that that can jam it up. Or yep. In most systems, it would just won't even allow it. Yep. It'll just wait till you stop. Uh, sp- particularly on um, Toyotas, they have a worm drive, so sometimes it won't engage straight away. It needs one wheel to sort of free rotate a little bit, right, and then okay. it'll engage. So yep. if it don't, doesn't engage in your car straight away, don't worry, it will engage. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so three things that you would go straight to on a stock vehicle pretty quick fire what are the first three things that you're modifying or, or changing to a stock vehicle uh, tires yep tires definitely straight away um oh, i'll probably put a little bit of power in so i could have like a little fridge or something yep. and then i might go we well, can just get away with an esky um depends what i'm doing if i'm going to the beach with a family i'll put an awning on it so you got some shelter i wouldn't do anything too drastic yeah yep. just like a couple of cheap mods but the best one's going to be, and the most expensive will be the tyres. Yep. Yeah. To so get the tyres on first and then... Yeah. And then, and then buy a handheld radio. That. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's four, but I'll, I'll allow. Um, <laughs> also, on the, uh, the the three, the quick fires, I'm going to say we'll stick to WA here. You're a master around WA, of course. You've been everywhere, but the, the best three places to go with a stock vehicle to, to test... Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a good question, man. Oh, okay. The first place would be Lancelin Sand Dunes. Yep. We're in WA. There's sand everywhere. Lancelin Sand Dunes. On the weekend, there's people everywhere. So if you do <laughs> get stuck, people everywhere. Someone's gonna help you out. Someone someone is dying to help you out. There are people <laughs> yeah, out there. Someone that, telling you how to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would go there because you'll learn your tire pressures. You'll learn how to go up and down dunes. But if you're going to go up and down dunes, like the big ones, just go with someone who knows what they're doing um, or just learn a lot yep. on the internet before you go there because you can severely damage your car or injure yourself going over a dune too yeah. fast or on a wrong angle. Maybe check so, the other side. Yeah, so just just check that yep. first. Yep. Uh, before I would go on the beach... I would, well, before I go down to the water level, I'd drive along the beach at the top, at the high side. Once you're used to that, yep. then you can sort of throw your car around a bit more, a bit yep. more confidence. So beach, Lancelin Dunes, and then I'll go up into hills. Yep. Because there's a lot of tracks there. They, they'll have like a little puddle. You'll learn how to go through that. Even like the power line track, actually. Yeah. But there's just really, take all the chicken lines. Yeah, because there's some really scary stuff up there. there is. But there's plenty of ways around them, which is... There's plenty of drowned cars up there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But you don't have to go through all the crazy stuff. But the power line is a great spot to learn how to drive your car. Yeah, yeah. So where where did you test the Hilux? I test. Yeah, you did. You did a fair bit stock, didn't you? Yeah, I I did. I actually did a fair bit stock. I went out to that white gum farm with a Jeep's Jeep's that I spoke about in episode one. Yep. Uh, I went to, I went to power line track. uh, Drove it there, tested it out. And man, it's surprising what you can do in, in a car. And then there's like a sp- place where we film modified uh, modified episodes, uh, episodes we go yeah, through yeah. cars. So we got this particular hill, took it up that and down. I've done many test drive cars there, stock. Yep. And um, it's a great spot to test the car. You just got to be a bit careful so you don't dent it. Um, but then I did the first proper trip when I upgraded the tyres and that's all I did. Right. Upgraded the tyres, that was it. And went to Jaeger up oh, down yeah. at Don Tracastro National... Park. Did is I say it? Did I say it right, Jan? Yeah, I did. That I did. is the hardest. Oh, mate. Place. Yeah. Yeah. That place. This is called Don's Park. Yeah. I? yeah. Don's. 
Yeah, and, and that highlights was surprising where it could go. Um, and it was so light. Yeah. Like, you know, but you I, I had the tyres down to 7 PSI down at Don Tricastro. Wow. Yeah. Up, what, what's the hill? Uh, it was Call Cup Hill. Yeah, right. Yeah, up. I had yep. it 7 PSI. Up that? Yeah, yeah 7 right. PSI on the back, oh, 8 PSI on the front. That is so low. It's because the car was so light. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. You needed to, yeah, right. Yep. But I only recommend going that low if you absolutely have to. Yep. I, the car just couldn't get up otherwise. It was yeah, right. too soft. Yep. For when are you when are you going into four high, four low? Like what's like I'm <clears throat> as soon as I'm on gravelly loose, I'm straight in four high. Um, yeah. And another. I, I I'm the same as yeah, well. And just, I, I think a lot of people don't actually do that. Yeah. And no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah. Think so. A lot of people like to keep it in two wheel drive for. Oh, yeah. For some yeah. reasons, but yeah. um, I, I think getting back to helping people get out there, just some basics around. Basics when are you, when are you lock when are you when going? You in, yeah, full high and when you're full low. Yeah. Well, first off, I'll take the I'll take the like the approach of with a vehicle, if it's a part time full drive system, when I say part time that means that when you're not in full drive it's two wheel drive. Yep. And then you've got the all wheel drive where it's constantly all wheel drive, like that's like a Prado two hundred. Yeah, right. But when you lock it in full drive, it locks the center and then you got four wheel drive. So a, an all wheel drive car Drive on a gravel road, all-wheel drive, doesn't matter. You don't have to put it in four-wheel drive. But for a part-time four-wheel drive, put it in four high when you're on gravel roads because it's the safety feature of the vehicle. Yep. Um, because on gravel roads, if you go around a corner a bit too fast, it can catch you out. So definitely there. But when we go like proper off-road, high range should be most of the time. But yep. when you get to the beach, I'll put it in low. If the vehicle starts to struggle, go straight to low. Yep. And you'll be surprised. Um, the difference between bogging could be high range and low range. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Easy fix there. Uh, what um, we and, here? But also, when you go, like most vehicles, most automatic vehicles, when you go into low range, you must be stationary and you've got to put it into neutral. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you don't, it's not going to go in and then often people, when they, they panic when they get bogged, right? Yep. And they're in high range and they're like, it won't go in to full low and they're freaking out. There's something wrong with the car. Yeah. You just got to just calm down, put in neutral yeah. into low. And when you exit low, neutral again. Yep. That was the, uh, that was actually, I learned that in the manual on the Ford Ranger, which um, I know a lot of people just throw those away when you get them, but um, yeah, that saved me, that <laughs> saved me a couple of times. So um, yeah. That's a good point, actually. Go, go to your manual. Yeah. Well, that's the, yeah, yeah. The, the rule book's right there, isn't it? Yeah. For you, so it's... Um, but I, as a typical bloke, I never read manuals. Nah, well... I try and learn how to use it. You get frustrated. I read it, when I, I read it when I got bogged. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're 79. Yeah. How many Ks has it done? That's done 260 or 70,000. Right. Yeah. Has it really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. What year is it? It's a 2013, but I don't daily it too much. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But yeah. then also having the troopy, the, like, I've got to keep the batteries going so i've got to swap the cars yep she must be nice mate heavy on fuel but yeah (laughs) (laughs) um can't complain though yeah i so i've had the ranger since 2017 i that's my one and only four-wheel drive i've done 150,000 in it now um you must like the car because you still got it right? well i can't i can't get rid of it that's a thing like i was very very close to buying it at land cruiser at one stage yeah um but because of because I enjoy my, my I, I love getting in my car and driving it each day, which yep. I think is a really important thing for for people listening. If you if that if you've got that feeling, then maybe there's the reason not to change. Um, yeah, which is I, I had I was that close to buying a Land Cruiser that I had one stone armrests. I bought one stone armrests. I oh, had, really? I had them at my house ready to go. <laughs> I had to pull the trigger on a car first. Um, what happened? You committed and then... I committed fully, yeah. I was I was like, I had mechanics going over troopies and um, very, very close, but I just, the, the love of my car. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. And, so, the, and the first mod you did was an, was an armrest because they're so yeah, uncomfortable. Yeah. I know. Well, that's like, you look inside it. <laughs> where's the cup holder for my coffee? Oh my God. Um, one cup holder and a 70. You, you got one. Well, okay. Oh, you would have more now. This I've changed it one, now, eh? yes, yeah, yeah. yes. But the Troopy only has one cup holder as well. But with that console in it, it's a really basic console. Yeah. You can fit another two coffees because I drink a lot of coffee. Yeah. And then you can actually fit a big water bottle in, in the other compartment. Right. 
You can fit so much. Yeah. So now you... I'm not going to change that console. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so basic. Uh, electric four-wheel drives. This will, I'm sure this will come up again, but a quick electric, one. Yeah. Yet to be proven. Electric four-wheel drives. I think the hybrid has a good place in Australia. Yep. But I think if you're going to get a new four-wheel drive and it's going to be electric, uh, one, the struggle is to get one. Two, you're limited to range. You really are limited to range. Yeah, and there's not, well, there's not a lot around yet, is there? Especially we're, if you're yeah. traveling remote. We're not in America. There's no gas station in every thirty miles. <laughs> you know, that's that was good actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was the exact words from uh, one of the guys we're traveling with. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, it's a gas station every thirty miles, and I was like, oh, all right. Yeah. Do, do you think it'll come? eventually but i still think hybrid is the way to go so the problem with hybrid is uh well if it's the problem you still have all the drive line with a hybrid because you've got to have the combustion engine which then got to drive through the drive shaft the diffs and all that but with a full electric car each wheel can have a motor right that's the advantage of a full electric car but the disadvantage in australia is 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 the vast distance so it might say like Rivian might boast about having a 400 mile range. That's a cool looking. Track, it is. By the way. Yeah. It is cool. Yeah. And have you seen tank mode where they just they spin yeah. spin on on one Incredible. spot? Yeah, it's awesome. But the thing is, they say the upgraded range is 400 miles. That is, they're always going to give you the best possible scenario. So you factor in headwinds, you factor in Australian conditioned roads, you factor in the heat, you factor in the cold. That's not. It's not going to get 400 miles. Weight on the vehicle. Yeah, it's, it's going to get like 300 yep. at best. And then yep. you've got to charge it. Where are you going to charge it? When you're off the main. Because main roads are installing um, charge points. That, that's the WA. Uh, yeah, up, up North, great, great Northern Highway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should, I'm not sure if main roads are behind it, but it's on a main road. Yep. So Great Northern Highway, they're going to put every 170 kilometers minimum, there'll be a charge point. So right. if there's a roadhouse, they can charge at a roadhouse. But if there's no roadhouse in that gap, they'll have to put like a diesel generator. <laughs> so you'll be pulling out to a diesel generator, swapping your credit card, plugging your car in yeah, right. and watching everyone go by. It'd be, a, it'd be <laughs> an interesting sight uh, when it gets to that. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it takes us. I don't think, I think it's going to keep growing. I don't know where it'll get to here <clears throat> in Australia anytime soon. Oh, but it's, yeah. it's Eventually it will come. It's but moving. I reckon we'll have flying cars before then. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> You're probably right. You'll probably be the first to have one too. Um, but w- when it comes to um, like like your stock road with with, with the limitations, um, one thing that gets overlooked a lot um, is is a roof rack for a wagon. So you can put a roof rack on a wagon, and you can fit so much more stuff. You can put fuel up space. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you can put your swags and everything up there. And then you've made you've improved that wagon. So if if going back on the mods, if I had a wagon roof racks number one number two are tires they'll happen at the same time um and then you've you sorted out you sort out your range you sorted out accommodation and you've got reliable tires yep whereas a ute whack a pair of tires on you got your tray so there is an advantage with the ute as you know because you need a bit more with the wagon to yep. achieve the same thing yep yeah yep. i know yep. i swung back a bit there no but no i like it because i've i, I think the ute for me is just so practical. Um, yep. But I suppose plenty of people out there, like Jaden, love the wagon. Yeah. Um, you've, you, there's ways around it, I suppose, is what you're saying with, with the roof rack and, and getting the same result. Plus, you can lock a wagon up. You can't necessarily lock a ute up. Yeah. So, is, so your gear's at risk. Yeah, always at risk. Yeah. Um, I reckon we get to around the fire pit, mate. Yeah, I think so. You ready for that? Yep. Let's get that fire cranking. We've uh, we've obviously we've got the questions in at the four wheel drive podcast on Instagram. We're going to change it up a little bit this week. Jaden, our good friend behind the mic, is the four wheel drive god. Yeah, the four wheel drive voice. god, the voice from above. How are we? He is going to fire the questions at us this week. I'm going to. So you're going blind now. I'm going as well. blind now as well. All right. So we're going to get the beginners' answers. We're going to get the expert answers. We've got, we've got the question anxiety happening here now. Yeah. So now I'm bringing on. The palms are sweaty. <laughs> Get touch, All right, our first question we've got from uh, Michael Grosso. How far can I take a stock vehicle off-road? Oh, I think we, 
we pretty much touched on that almost, but how far can you go? Okay. It's as far as you can go until you get stuck, I suppose. Yeah, as far as yeah, until <laughs> you get stuck. You never know. Um, as far as your fuel can go, <laughs> you can get pretty far. You just got to pick the right line. So say if your mate's like taking the hard line, there's always an easier yeah. line. Yeah. And if you if you go with people, they can help you out too. Yeah. Be you sensible, know. but test, like have, a, have yeah. a little bit of a crack as well. You need to find out. Yeah, and that's there's it. There's plenty of testing, I suppose, clips out there youtube whatever you, you type in that vehicle they'll show you a pretty good indication of what that what that vehicle yeah. can do and the different modes that it's got especially on those modern four-wheel drives yeah sometimes a few too many modes on there don't yes. use the modes just go straight the four-wheel drive high or low and you'll be fine <laughs> you're starting to really you're sending your flavor out i reckon it's, oh it's yeah yeah clear. <laughs> <laughs> what's the next one mate uh we got a question in from bleachy 58 uh, what are the laws on custom bull bars, uh, ADR approving, etc.? Okay, so with the bull bars, so most bull bars you can buy, say, ARB, TJM, Officer Lock, Off-Road Animal, On Car, which is what I use, and there's so many different brands. Most of these, well, all of them should come with an ADR sticker. So when you get the bull bars, should ADR be being ADR approved. So Australian, oh, I forgot what it stands for. Jaden will pull it up it's for us. The, the legal yeah yeah it's it, yeah it's yeah. like it's like the, the the road rules the road law of modification yeah. of car so this is approved for road so insurance will be covered you won't get pulled over and and have to remove it yep. you won't be you know done for neglect or whatever um because it is adr approved so ADR approval is important for especially when you've got airbags and things like that so if you have an old uh gq patrol you could do a custom bull bar for it um, but it still has to comply to some things. It, you don't have to worry about crash testing it, but you have to comply to how far it sticks forward, the angle of it, how far it goes up and down. Right. There's a couple of things there. So there are guidelines which can be found um, through Department of Transport. But generally speaking, most people who have a vehicle will have airbags. You've got to have an ADR approved. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, you'll be liable... Uh, for your occupants in the vehicle should the airbag not, not right. deploy. Yeah. Yep. And just to jump in, ADR, Australian design rules. That's it. Okay. Australian design rules. Yeah. And I'm not going to chime in on that question because no. I've got no idea. Well, that's... Yeah. So thanks, Ronnie. They're not... The no. questions <laughs> aren't always for everyone. Sometimes <laughs> they're just for Ronnie. Yeah, and you don't have to mention it. Oh, I know when they're for Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, probably for Ronnie, but I'm sure you can jump in as well, Liam. I'll uh, from Hayden dot hu 8 are newer four-wheel drives actually that bad do we really want ronnie to cover this one or i think i, think, <laughs> I mean you've got you a newer four-wheel drive liam i've got a newer four-wheel drive yeah i'm still i'm in i'm in i'm behind the line of ronnie's old to new so i fit in there but it's, it's 2017 it, like the ford tech at the time was it, it's pretty good for this you know six seven years ago now so um for me a modern four-wheel drive is is probably a lot more practical for what I'm after, especially a lot of my driving is city driving to and from work. Um, so the modern comforts of an auto, Apple CarPlay, all electric windows, every, everything that come with the modern four-wheel drives suit me perfectly. And I've also been able to get some dirt, beach, yeah. heavy off-roading done in it as well, which... And I'll, I'll 100% agree with you there. For most people, it's suitable like for a short trip to just go out to the beach and stuff like that they're fine yep. and you're probably better off to be honest because you got warranty and all that but it's more uh it's only really a concern if you're going really remote and you want to put heaps of mods on it yeah that's where i would say i'm drawing a line as of now any new car that comes out i yep. wouldn't use that as a remote tourer yeah um your ford ranger i would use that as a remote tourer yep. but not the new one yeah, and that's just because all all the tech, and they're not built as strong. Nah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think everyone's ultimate yeah touring vehicle is going to be something ar around the seventy series or yeah, you know, or like a patrol or something. And, yeah, like yeah. just robust and mechanical. Yeah, and they're, they're proven, right? They're, they're yeah, they're proofs in the pudding. Yeah, um, when to DIY versus hand over to a professional? This one in from DG McCarthy. Um, like if you've got a stock vehicle yeah that's very dependent like if it's a newer vehicle 
you're probably more reluctant to, I mean, you probably more should hand it over. Anything to do with breakup grades, definitely. Um, oh, I've got a bit of an experience there on, <laughs> on changing some pads and I put them in wrong and, and it fell out when I did the quick test drive. Right. And then I went to pick, and then because I had to go back and pick it up after driving into a ditch to stop the car. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going off a bit here. I, I ran back and quickly, I actually overtook a learner as well. I was getting a bit frustrated. So I was, I was like, road. I was on a road. Oh. I was driving around and like this learner was going really slow. So I drove around, come up to this T junction and then put the foot on the brake and the foot went to the floor and I heard this ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and I was like, uh oh. And then I had to go into the ditch. Ran out in the road to grab it before the learner drove up to me. <laughs> grabbed the brake pad, which was obviously red hot. Burnt my fingers on it. So that was an experience. Jeez. What so was that? In? That was seventy nine. Oh wow. I I um I had a problem with the brakes and I cleaned them out and I didn't put it back properly. So right. there's a good example to get a professional to do it. Big ticket items. Um, Obviously the professionals. Yeah. If you're not confident with it, get someone else to do yeah. it for sure. Electrics. Um, but. There are things you need to request so you get it done properly. But I think we'll cover all this kind of stuff in yep. a future because that's like a whole yeah, a episode. Like um, but if you're not confident in what you're doing, hand it over to someone else. Yep. But yep. DIYs give so money. Older cars, DIY, yeah. newer cars, hand it over. Yep. Yeah, on that um, older versus newer cars, we've got a um, got one here. Is it worth buying an older four-wheel drive, for example, a Nissan Patrol or Land Cruiser six-cylinder? And should you time them or buy, uh, should you tune them or buy a newer four cylinder dual cab and tune that one for touring? Uh, from Melden to Souza. Yeah, I'd say horses for courses. Um, again, it depends on what you're doing. The newer cars, I would be a bit reluctant to tune too much out of because the engine's smaller, they're producing more power, the parameters are smaller, I would say. So with the older engines, like say the um, V8 Land Cruiser, very underpowered, but you can get a lot more out of them and they'll handle it. A bit like, um, you know, like the older patrols and stuff like that. So I would be, you can of course tune a newer car, but I wouldn't push too much out of it. Yep. But having said that, I wouldn't push too much out of an older car as well. Because if you're asking too much from that engine, you're making it less reliable. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so a mild tune. Yeah, okay. I can't really weigh in on that too much. I mean, I've had my Ranger tuned, noticed a, you know, a decent yeah. um, amount of power out of it afterwards. And I think that the main thing with, with your car in particular, because that's the 3.2, yeah? Yep. Yeah, so you would have got the lag tuned out of it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is the biggest one, I suppose. Like yeah. You sort of, you take away that, it feels like two seconds sometimes. <laughs> um, so you take that out, which... Then obviously you can go into throttle controls and all this as well mm. that that take that out for you too. But um, yeah, I've definitely noticed a difference in in you know, post tune yep. with my car. But that's about all I've got for you on that one. Yeah, it's just don't over tune it. No, nah. and you should be pretty good. Nah. Yeah. yeah, don't expect too much out of it. Like I no, said yeah, yeah, last yeah, and don't expect to save too much fuel either because people tune yeah. to save fuel and then they end up on the gas a long way. Yeah, you know? yeah, sounds nice. <laughs> here we go. All right, we've got our last one here. Uh, buy some cashews. That's the person who sent it in. Okay. Um, not. I could go at cashew right don't, now. Don't buy cashews, but. but um, I'd go well with the shelters. <laughs> yeah, that would <laughs> actually. How many Ks is too many Ks for a D, 4D, a 1HZ, etc.? Like, you were on car sales earlier, Liam. I'm sure you can weigh on to this. What, what, what's the kilometre limit when you see a car on car sales? Oh, I set mine at 200 at the moment, 200. especially for a Toyota. But I'd almost be happy to go above that with some of these, you know. I don't know too much about the detail of these engines, but these are pretty reliable. Yeah. Depends on what the car's done as well. If you can tell it's beat up. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I love seeing, I love looking at like a, check out a 100 series Land Cruiser. I love those as well. And if I see that they've got the back seats in them still, <laughs> that's a big that's a big tick for me yeah yeah across car sales it, it, you know they haven't set it up with drawers they haven't set it up for touring that's a good tip little insights the like back that back seats I've, are still I've there picked up yeah <laughs> yeah 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 but I, I don't know what, what's your what do you reckon uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one I think if I was going to look at a second hand car I think 200,000 is probably getting a bit there but you know what like some people that's their price range and I would rather buy a 250,000 kilometre done Hilux 
or a Land Cruiser over, say, something less reliable. Yep. Let's say it may be a Holden Jackaroo that's done because they have some issues. Yep. So it's, I think it's just like do, do research and then you know which cars can so kind of go to distance and which yep. can't. For example, Torb's my mate who's got the 79 series Land Cruiser single cab, his vehicle has done nearly 500,000 Ks. Wow. And he's on the same motor. So for me, who's done 260,000 in my car, I'm pretty confident yeah. that I'll get beyond that because I don't drive my car like he does. <laughs> Sorry, Torbs. <laughs> you're listening. No, it's, it's, but that, that is good confidence, I suppose. Like when you say that, yeah. it's hard to, you know, you yeah. can't deny that that's a. You can't deny yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And actually, sorry, boys, I've actually just found one more um, just regarding the stock vehicles. This one from Sawzy. Sawzy. I've got a stock patrol. What kind of terrain should I be avoiding? What is the hardest one? Stock um, patrol. For me? Is it a Y62 or 61? Do we know? Uh, not mentioned. Yeah, I don't think there's anything you should avoid, to be honest. Um, very capable Nissan patrol. I mean, pff, like, uh, go anywhere. Yeah. Like, um, it'll be like a stock Ranger. Like, there's no nothing I would avoid there either. You just got to pick the driving line. So if you patrol, just pick the driving line. Um, don't do anything too hectic. You know, you'll learn quickly about the car, what you can go over and what you can't go over. I mean, we all find that out pretty yeah. quick, don't we? Maybe if it's a Y sixty two, you're probably not trying to flex up too no. much on some, you know, on on the hardcore stuff, but. GUs probably your of, yeah. you know, stock GUs G or GQs. GQs they, well, GQs probably aren't stock anymore. They've been around for that long. You must have tinkered with them to keep them going, but tolerate a bit more to throw around. Yeah, I I would say if you're going if you get up to like a big hill and it looks nasty and you're like not sure, just don't do yeah, it. If you're not sure, yeah, maybe don't. That takes that takes experience knowing your car. Like I don't, I don't care how good a driver you are. If you if you drive a completely different car and you get an obstacle like that and you got a bit of doubt, don't do it. Like a, a mate of mine, he's got, uh, he used to be a racing driver in the off-road and sometimes we'll be out and he'll go, no, nah, I've got a bad feeling about this. I'm not doing this hill. Yeah. And I'm looking at this hill going, there's not much to it. But, you know, but then there's some other, other times you wouldn't even think twice and I'm like, there's no way I'll ever yeah. do that hill and he just drives up it. Yeah. 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 Gut feel. Gut feel. That's it. That's all for the questions, mate. Around the fire pit. Only good one. Yeah. That's yeah. everything. All right. That wraps us up. Episode Already. two, four-wheel drive podcast on Instagram. You'll find us on Backchat Studios, YouTube, Southern River Band. We'd love to thank again. That's a four-wheel drive, drive podcast driven by Shelter. And you got any questions? Hit it up on the Instagram, Insta, right? Four WD podcast. Right. Cheers, guys. See you next time. Time for a shelter. Get you.